Thank you very much for the introduction, Rob. Um, yeah, my name's Eva. I'm from the Center for Collective Intelligence Design at Nesta. And I'm here today to give a quick introduction into collective intelligence and also talk a bit about the work that we're doing um, at the Center at Nesta. So I want to start by asking you to imagine that you're the mayor of a big city. And your city faces regular flooding because of climate change, more extreme, happening more often. But you're really struggling to coordinate your emergency responses to that because it's, you know, it's really new, like it's not clear what the pattern of the flooding is. Wouldn't it be great if there was like a map that updated in real time how the flooding changes in the city? Well, there is. It's called Peta Benchana. And it crowdsources reports from citizens in Jakarta via Twitter, Facebook and Telegram and combines them with official government data and um, data, the sensor data from hydraulic sensors in the cities to create real-time flood maps. Citizens can then use that, these maps to navigate the city more, more safely, um, and also emergency response teams can use it to coordinate their response better and to communicate with affected citizens in um, real time. Here's um, an overview of the platform. Um, so this is a screenshot from their map. So you can see like a lot is green here, so it means like alert level four, it's you know, just use cautions, not too dangerous, but essentially this map updates all the time once people um, submit new reports. Another um, example, imagine you're a farmer in a really rural part of the world and your sheep is suddenly sick with really unusual symptoms, you just can't really tell what's happening. But because you're in a really rural part, you don't have any internet connection, so you can't Google the solution. What do you do? Wouldn't it be great if there was a way to communicate with farmers who might have the answer, even if they're not around? Um, yeah, to, to help you out with the solution. But probably, as you guessed, also this exists. It's called WeFarm. And WeFarm is a free information service, peer-to-peer -peer service for um, small-scale farmers in East Africa, where they can ask each other questions related to, I don't know, problems they face with their crops or their livestock. So they send their questions via text message to a number, and then an algorithm in the background matches them with the farmers somewhere in another part of East Africa um, who is best placed to answer that question. So Essentially, they receive an answer within minutes without having to use the internet. So these are just two examples that show that, you know, no matter what, how complex or urgent the problem that you're facing is, it's actually quite helpful to not be by yourself. So the question I want to ask, like we're asking ourselves at the Center for Collective Intelligence Design is how do we get smarter together? So thanks to technological progress, we're now able to mobilize um, human intelligence at greater scale and in new ways, so particularly in three main ways. First of, us, uh, first of all, technology is connecting more of us together, so it's happening right now with the live stream, so we talk to people we don't even see. Um, secondly, we all have smartphones, there's constantly new, new data generated that can help us um, unlock fresh insights into the world. Um, and thirdly, technology can perform parts of intelligence that humans are not so good at, such as processing large volumes of data, for example. So essentially, we're talking about combining humans, data, and technology, and harness them all together to achieve a common goal or um, find a solution to a complex problem. We call this process of mobilizing wider range of information, insights, and idea, uh, ideas collective intelligence. The idea of collective intelligence is not new. Um, essentially, it's based on the theory that groups of people are, of diver diverse groups of people are collectively smarter than each individual by themselves. That's the basic assumption. This is an example from a collective intelligence project from the 19th century. So this is the um, Oxford English Dictionary, dictionary that was produced um, in collaboration of a lot of volunteers all over the UK um, who submitted millions of words and their meanings to the editor. So it didn't happen by people just sitting in a room, you know, four or five people sitting in a room doing it together, but it was kind of a distributed way of getting all the information in there. And that's like a really early example of collective intelligence. One way we can think of collective intelligence is Collective intelligence is like a giant brain where the different function of intelligence or the brain functions are kind of performed in a distributed way. So not necessarily everything has to happen in one place. Where technology comes in is that, as I mentioned earlier, machines can now do things that you are not so good at. For example, um, memorizing large forms of data, analyzing that data. And humans are better in other parts of functions of intelligence, right? So in creativity, empathy, making judgments, like nuanced judgment in situations with high uncertainty. This is where humans can kind of, and humans and machine can, machines can sort of um, complement each other. Just three examples to show that collective intelligence is happening all around us all the time these days without us actually noticing it. So the first example is um, Waze, which is a, an app 
where location data is crowdsourced from people um, using roads, like drivers, um, in real time. Um, so they're crowdsourcing traffic hazards, like traffic jams or um, construction sites. And then the map gives like kind of a recommendation of the best route. Second example in the middle is Zooniverse, which is a citizen science platform. And the most famous example there is probably Galaxy Zoo, which is where millions of volunteers kind of collaborate in analyzing um, images that are taken by scientists from telescopes to identify new galaxies and stars. And this is a really good example where citizen science has worked out really well because there have been some really big breakthroughs um, by essentially lay astronomers um, on this platform. And the last example I just want to talk about quickly is um, Duolingo, where human and machine intelligence are combined because Duolingo kind of tests out different approaches to learning with different groups of people that use the platform. And then they essentially kind of analyze the, with the eye in the background, which works best and then can then use this approach, best approach to language learning for all the, all the people. So the Center for Collective Intelligence Design was set up in 2018 at Nesta. And our goal was really to grow and support a community that kind of tries to solve social problems by um, tapping into the wisdom of the crowd. Um, often this is happening nowadays with the um, help of technology. Doesn't necessarily have to, but in our case, that's what we're looking at. In terms of what we're doing, so we're doing research, for example, and we're doing research ourselves. We've analyzed hundreds of collective intelligence projects on what they consist of, how they work. Um, we were running a crowd prediction challenge last year with, um, in collaboration with um, Good Judgment Project, where essentially we we're trying to figure out whether how good crowds are in predicting certain events. M many of the questions we asked were related to Brexit and the crowds were particularly good actually in that, better than experts, I would say, most of the time. Um, we're also helping, supporting others to do research. So we have a grants program of which here, like we're funding ATI at the moment, for example, a couple of other grantees have also seen in the room where um, organizations um, undertake experiments to test certain elements of collective intelligence and how it can best be designed and applied to solve social problems. We're also doing program work though. We work with the UNDP, for example. So the last year, the UNDP has set up um, 60 accelerator labs around the world to um, accelerate the achievement of the sustainable development goals. And we're working with some of them to help them like, introduce collective intelligence as a, as a method essentially to achieve these goals faster. And we also develop pro um, tools and guidelines for people who want to design their own collective intelligence um, projects. I'll come back to that in a second. So now I just want to talk quickly about um, one piece of research that we're just at the moment doing, which is about um, how artificial intelligence can enhance and scale collective intelligence um, for applications relevant to the public sector. So this is a report that's going to be published in um, about 10 days time actually today. So at an event called Smarter Data for Better AI at Nesta. So you're still welcome to sign up. Registration are still open. Um, but we're going to launch this report. So because it's not published yet, I can only talk a limited about what's it going to be in there. But I just want to give a couple of examples of how AI and the crowd can essentially work together and how they connect it. So the first way is where people knowingly interact with each other and also um, with an AI, but they can take take turns to solve a problem. So this can happen, for example, um, as I mentioned earlier, by combining the different functionalities and the capabilities of humans and machines, but also um, through a feedback loop between the crowd, the crowd and, and AI. So ways, what I mentioned earlier, for example, is um, using AI to kind of learn and understand the patterns of people, like how they move around in, 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 in the city. So the day-to-day -day patterns, almost predicting it, and then mapping out potential travel routes. But th these recommendations update every time the cities, citizens actively input data, like, oh, there's an accident here, there's construction work there, there's traffic jam there, jam there. So there's like a really good example of how this feedback loop works. Another example is where networks of humans and sensors either passively or actively gather data, and this data is then used as kind of input for machine learning algorithms. And the insights and lessons from this analysis can, are then used and utilized by the wider community that uses that platform to generate new knowledge. There's an example that's called One Soil. It's um, a platform that um, analyzes, there's an AI that analyzes um, sensor data, on the ground sensor and satellite images about um, agricultural land, and essentially produces maps which help, you know, about like, um, for example, where the health of crops is in danger, in danger or um, maps the boundaries of fields to help farmers in the agricultural community that uses this, this um, application um, plan better for the future and just understand problems better. Third example is where people and machines actually work at the same time to solve a problem. So there's an example of one, another of our grantees, Unanimous AI, they have developed a platform called Swarm AI, which is essentially where humans and machines work together 
at the same time. So it's, it's like a crowd of group of people on an online platform with an artificial agent in the background. They work together as kind of part of a closed loop system to um, come to a consensus or make predictions. So that's being used, for example, in medical diagnostics or also um, to identify political preferences of people, for example. Fourth um, element is where AI is used to improve the experience um, of individuals and online platforms or enable collective intelligence by connecting knowledge and um, groups of people. So we found the example I mentioned in the beginning, this peer-to-peer -peer network that connects the AI work in the background, connecting the right people with each other. Um, but there's also examples of um, where not people are connected to each other, but people and information. For example, um, an organization called Syrian Archive, um, they crowdsource footage from war, zo war zones, for example, Syria um, and, or Yemen. And then there's an AI that kind of works through all this database and analyzes it. And human rights activists or NGOs can then use this tool to be like matched with the right information that they need on the platform. And the last point um, would be, uh, last example of how machines and um, humans can work together or crowds of people is where collective intelligence is actually already shaping most of AI. So supervised approaches to machine learning rely on large data sets um, that need to be labeled. And this work is often done by crowd workers on, for example, Amazon Mechanical Turk. This is kind of the bit of the hidden untold story behind AI often um, that you know, it's actually crowd workers doing the actual like, labeling of it, for example. Um, but also AI can, for example, be augmented by crowd um, crowdsourcing, for example, and make like data sets more diverse. So there's an example by Mozilla, it's called Common Voice Project. And people can record their voice and validate other people's voices. So people are supposed to say a sentence and then people can validate if that's the sentence they hear. And the aim of this is that um, data sets that use for speech recognition um, technologies, for example, are more diverse and more representative of um, society. I just really quickly want to talk about one of our grantees. They're also in the room, so I better get this right <laughs> now. Um, Citizen Lab, which is a um, citizen engagement platform for local authorities. And they um, are already using natural language processing to cluster similar ideas on the platform and extract keywords for people to, um, for citizens um, to find similar ideas. In the context of our grants program, they started to look into whether they can use natural language understanding as well to kind of um, translate this unstru unstructured citizen data into policy recommendations that can then be taken up by um, policymakers and public servants in local authorities. So um, this is like ongoing work because they want to identify how do they actually fit this in the workflow, like where is this actually adding most value and where is automation necessary and where maybe other things will take more priority and are more important. Um, I mentioned the Collective Intelligence Design Playbook that we have um, and developed over the last year or so and um, published in October. This is available online for free to download, but I also brought a hard copy in case anyone wants to have a look. We only have, unfortunately, one hard copy because people really like it, but we're probably going to print more at some point. But essentially, it's just like um, a toolkit which explains exactly if you want to set up your own Collective Intelligence project, like what do you need to do step by step from data collection about like how to involve the right people, um, what technologies could you use, what makes sense. So it's like 200 pages long, but you can download the whole thing for free as well online. If anybody wants to have a look later, just let me know and I'm happy to talk you through. I just want to end with this quote because I just really like it. Um, technology can offer new creative solution, but it should always be um, a means to an end at the service of citizens. I think this is really at the core of what we do at Nesta. So I just wanted to share this with you. Thank you very much.